my name is Lawrence van der Maaten. I'm a research scientist at uh, Facebook AI Research based in New York. Um, and today I'll be talking about some of the work we've been doing uh, in visual recognition and visual understanding. I'm really sorry I cannot be with you in, in person today. Uh, I was really looking forward to, to coming to visit you in, in Moscow. Um, but, you know, let's hope next year that I can come in, in person. Um, in the meantime, I'll try and tell you something about, uh, about our work. So let's start with uh, visual recognition. Um, so I'm sure as you're all aware, um, you know, convolutional networks have been tremendously successful over the past decade or so. Um, and, and achieve state-of-the-art performances in, in tasks like image classification or detection or semantic segmentation, et cetera. And what these models do is they repeatedly filter an image. Um, they learn these filters based on uh, a set of label training images. They repeatedly filter the image using these uh, learned filters in order to produce a representation that is, that is semantic, that carries information about uh, what is depicted in the image. Um, and why has, have convolutional networks started to work so well in, in recent years? Well, there are basically three ingredients that, that sort of came together. The first one is models. We learned a lot about um, how to design good convolutional networks, starting with, with AlexNet to uh, modern networks like ResNets or, or DenseNets or et cetera. The second thing is data. Right, um, the 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 recent progress in in image recognition was really fueled by the availability of large annotated data sets like ImageNet, and the third one was computation. Right, GPUs are really playing a a key enabling role in in allowing us to train good image recognition models. Now, if you look at vision today, then um, a, a very common approach to solving a vision problem is to first train a model on a large source data set. Typically, this is ImageNet. Um, and then to fine tune the model that was trained on this source data set on some target task. So for instance, if I'm interested in bird classification, I would pre-train on the ImageNet source data sets. And then I would fine tune on the uh, CUB birds target data set. And then we measure accuracy on the target task. Now, this raises the question, is ImageNet, is that the right pre-training task? Is that the right source task? Or is there something else that we can use? And in particular, what we've been interested in is the question, can we use large amounts of weakly supervised images for, for pre-training? So instead of using ImageNet, can we take billions of images uh, from the internet and use weak annotations that we have for these images to pre-train our models? And in particular, what we've been looking at is hashtag supervision. So why are we interested in hashtags? Well, one, it's easy or relatively easy to get billions of public images and hashtags. Hashtags are more structured than things like captions. Um, and they were often assigned to images to make them searchable. Um, so they were assigned to images in, in order to um, provide semantic information on the content of the image. Um, so for instance, in this example, um, you see a picture of a cheesecake and the image is labeled with hashtag cheesecake. Now, of course, hashtag supervision is far from perfect. Um, so here's an example of an image with a bunch of hashtags. And, you know, some of these hashtags are, are relevant, like hashtag cat, but others are not, right? Uh, for instance, hashtag travel is not really visually relevant. Other hashtags are not in the photo. Uh, for instance, hashtag family is, is missing in this photo. And moreover, there are lots and lots of false negatives. Um, so for instance, the building or the fence in this photo are not, are not annotated with hashtags. And so really the question that we're asking here is, is scaling up to training on billions of these images, is that sufficient to make up for all this noise that is in the hashtag supervision? So here are the experiments we did. We selected a set of hashtags basically by taking all nouns from WordNet. And we used WordNet synsets to merge hashtags into a canonical form. So for instance, we merged hashtag brown bear and Ursus Arctos, which is the Latin term for brown bear, into a, single, into a single target. And then we downloaded all public Instagram images that have at least one of these hashtags associated with it. 
The final list of hashtags uh, has about 17,000 hashtags. You see the list here. So it starts with things like Artfark or Artwolf, and it ends at the end at uh, Zygnema or Zygocactus or Zygdoptera. Um, in total, there are 17,000 of these hashtags, and there are about three and a half billion images um, that, that, um, that have at least one of these hashtags associated with them. I cannot show you the images, but you can look at them for yourself by going on Instagram um, and using the hashtag search tool. Um, you can search for hashtag brown bear and you'll get a sense for what the, the training data in these experiments looks like. So what we do is we train ResNext models um, on, this, on this hashtag data. Um, and we essentially minimize the multi-class logistic loss. The one change we make is that we use a C of K vector to represent multiple hashtags. So if there are C, positive um, hashtags associated with an image, then we'll, uh, we'll use a vector of length k of like 17,000. And we'll set each, um, um, each value that corresponds to a hashtag that is present to 1 over c, uh, where c is the number of hashtags associated with the image. So this is a change that we need to make because hashtag uh, supervision is by nature uh, uh, multi-labeled. So what do the results look like? Um, so here you see um, on the y-axis, the top one accuracy on, on ImageNet. Um, so ImageNet is going to be our target task here. But our source task is um, two different things. The gray bar corresponds to uh, using ImageNet as the source task. So this is basically standard ImageNet training and, and testing. Um, and a model like ResNex get a, gets around 79.6% top one accuracy on the ImageNet task. And these purple bars here, this first purple bar, corresponds to pre-training a model on 1 billion Instagram images, where the hashtags are selected to match the ImageNet classes. So there are about 1,500 hashtags that we use here, and about 1 billion images. And these 1,500 hashtags, they correspond to some ImageNet classes. And the other three purple bars correspond to pre-training on from one to three and a half billion uh, Instagram images without any selection of the, of the hashtags. And what you see is that in both these cases, um, you get large improvements in the classification accuracy on ImageNet, right? So the same model by pre-training on this weekly supervised data can go from 79.6% accuracy all the way up to 84.2% accuracy. And this is an effect that we see uh, across ImageNet tasks so what we're looking at here are versions of ImageNet where we have larger numbers of classes, so not just the 1,000 standard classes that most people use in, in ImageNet experiments. And these models are actually available in the PyTorch hub, so you can, you can play around with them for yourself. What's interesting is um, um, that we can do experiments like this. So what we're looking at here is the accuracy of models of different sizes. Um, on the x-axis, I show the capacity of the model in terms of the number of mult add operations that they perform. And the gray line corresponds to standard ImageNet training. Again, we're looking at ImageNet top one accuracy on the y-axis. Um, and what you see is that, you know, by making models bigger, that you get better accuracy. Um, this is something that, that we've all known. Um, but if you look at the purple bar, the, the purple line corresponds to Instagram pre-training and then fine-tuning on, on ImageNet. And what you see is that this line goes up much steeper, right? And so uh, what this tells us is that um, as we increase uh, our model capacity, we sort of get more bang for our buck from this pre-training on large weekly supervised uh, training data sets, right? The gap between ImageNet pre-training and Instagram pre-training gets, gets larger. And this also corresponds to our best result, which is about 85.4% top one accuracy, which was state of the art at the, at the time when we published this result. Another thing that's interesting to look at are these kinds of learning curves where you put the number of training images in the source task, um, so in the Instagram task, on the, um, on the uh, x-axis, and you look at uh, accuracy on the, uh, on the target task, on the the uh, y-axis. And what you see is that um, uh, basically across tasks that accuracy goes up as you increase the number of images in the source task. And more or less, it seems to be that the uh, amount of gain that you get uh, in accuracy 
is is um, is basically a, a fixed amount every time you double the amount of training data. So notice that the x-axis is on a logarithmic scale here. So this is great. We're getting really good performances in tasks like, like image classification. 85.4% um, sounds like maybe we haven't solved ImageNet yet, but, but really if you sort of look into what these models are doing, they work really well on a task like ImageNet. And, and so you may think that we've solved image classification or image recognition. And that's not, that's maybe not quite the case. Um, so one question we've been asking ourselves is, does image recognition work for everyone? Um, and so if you look at, at popular cloud services um, you, and you use images like this as input into those cloud services for, for image classification, then you may think yes. Um, so for instance, if you, if you put this image of hand soap into, into cloud, uh, cloud services, they will predict toiletry, or they'll predict spice for the spice bottles here, or they'll predict toothpaste for the, the toothpaste here. Uh, and so you may conclude like, you know, image recognition is really working. Until you take images from different countries, um, different types of, uh, of images, for instance, this image of soap from Nepal, which is classified as food, or if you take these spice bottles uh, from the Philippines, which uh, in the Philippines, apparently spices are packaged differently than, than, in, uh, than in the US, um, and the prediction will be bare. Or if you take the toothpaste out of, um, out of um, sort of a, a white sink bathroom um, and you photograph it in, uh, in Burundi, it suddenly will not be recognized anymore. Um, and so we've been doing a study to try and understand these effects better. And in particular, for, to do that, we have been using the Dollar Street dataset, which is a dataset collected by Gapminder, uh, which is a, a, a nonprofit um, that collected this dataset to try and show how people across the world live and uh, at different income levels. And these photos are annotated not just for object class, uh, they contain about 117 different classes or household objects. Uh, but they're also annotated for the country that they came from and the family income uh, from the family where, uh, where the objects were, were photographed. And in total, there are around 20,000 photos from 117 classes. So here's what we did. Um, we used these photos and we classified them using five major uh, uh, cloud image recognition systems. And we measured the accuracy of the systems per country. Um, and if you do that, uh, here's the map that you get. So this is an average across five systems. Um, and so what you see here is an average accuracy in image recognition per country, where the red color corresponds to about 60% accuracy, and the dark green color corresponds to 90% accuracy. And if you look at these results, you see that the accuracy varies greatly per country, right? The accuracy is very high in, in the US or in, or in European countries, it's already a little bit lower in, uh, in Russia, and it's particularly low in, in Southeast Asia, parts of South America, and, uh, and Africa. And we're showing average results here, but these results are really quite consistent across all services that we analyzed. You can also, give, with this data set, look at accuracy as a function of household income. And you see that there's a clear correlation there where image recognition systems work less well in, in low-income households. And this is not just due to correlation between income and, and country, um, because if we analyze the data for uh, a country like India, which has a large uh, income disparity, um, then we see the same effects where um, for, low income, uh, for low income families, these object recognition systems work less well. So why does this happen? We, we think there are sort of two reasons. One. In the computer vision community, a lot of data set collection relies on services like Flickr that are primarily popular in, um, in the West. And so that introduces a, a strong geographic bias in the data sets that we use for, for training and testing our systems. And the second problem is that, that most data set collection in our community starts with English queries. Um, so if you go on Flickr and you search for wedding, you'll get pictures like in the top row um, of a, a bride in a white gown, et cetera. Um, but if you would search for the Hindi word for wedding, um, you'd find very visually very different images, right? It's very colorful dresses and so on. 
And the same if you do this for spices, right? Um, if you search for spices in English on, on Flickr, you get all these spice bottles. If you search for spices in Hindi on Flickr, you get very different types of, types of images. Um, and so what, what this is showing is that, you know, even though our, our systems are, are getting really good and our technology is really, you know, is, is really getting mature, there's still a lot of work to, uh, to do in order to make these systems really work in, in practice for everyone. So that was a very quick overview of some of the work we're, we're doing in image recognition. For the second half of this talk, I want to talk a little bit about moving to visual understanding. Um, our, the success in, in, in image recognition raises questions about what's next, right? And in particular, what we would like to do is we would like to develop systems that really understand images. Um, and so that can solve tasks like, you know, maybe visual question answering, right? That can answer questions, any question you ask about an image, or that can do tasks like uh, image captioning. So really describe an image and really um, uh, sort of display understanding of image content. So we've been looking at image captioning and one of the problems we ran into is that we found that evaluating the relevance of captions to images is, is very difficult. Um, and so there's a lot of work in, um, in this space, but we're, we were really wondering whether this, um, this, this work is sort of accurately um, measuring the accuracy of, uh, of captioning systems. So let me demonstrate what I, what I mean by an example. So here's a, here's a photo. Um, and if you run this photo through a captioning system, um, you may get a caption like a bunch of luggage sitting on top of a floor. And then if you use uh, popular um, evaluation measures like CIDR D, um, this uh, caption will get a CIDR D score of about 56, which is pretty high. It indicates like this is a pretty decent caption for this photo. Now, this is a photo made in New York. Uh, I'm a New Yorker, so I know this is not correct. Um, I know that this is a pile of garbage sitting next to a trash can. Um, now, if I ask the CIDR D score, you know, how good this caption is, I will get a CIDR D score of 0 0.1, which is basically indicating that, um, that, the, um, uh, that the caption is wrong according to the evaluation measure. So we look more into this, and in particular, we did an experiment where we asked humans to evaluate the correctness of uh, captions produced by captioning systems. Um, and we compared those to um, the values that are given by popular measures for captioning systems like Blue 4 or Cider or Meteor or Spice. Um, and the results of that analysis you see here, so on the x-axis you see the caption measure, uh, the caption accuracy measure, and on the y-axis you see uh, the correctness as evaluated by humans on a Likert scale. So a higher is more correct. And what you see is that there's only a very limited, a very small correlation between these two, right? So that things like Blue 4 and Cider only give you a very limited signal about the quality of a caption. And this really raises questions about, um, you know, how reliable caption evaluations are. So you could say, well, maybe an, an alternative here is to look at something like image retrieval. So this is a task where you get a question, uh, where you get a text query, like a person wearing a banana headdress and necklace, um, and you have to retrieve an image. And then if you retrieve an image of, uh, of a person wearing a banana headdress, then you probably did okay. But it turns out on, on data sets, even on data sets like Coco Captions, this doesn't work well because these image retrieval data sets don't provide true negatives. It turns out there are multiple photos of people wearing uh, banana headdresses and there are multiple photos of green clocks in the street. And so you're very likely to pick the wrong one, right? And so this lack of, of annotation of, of true positives and true negatives is, is really a problem in image retrieval evaluations. So to try and circumvent this problem, uh, we develop BISON, um, um, the BISON task, which stands for binary image selection. So in this task, you also get a text query. So for instance, you get the text query plates filled with carrots and beets on a white table. Um, but you, in addition to the text query, you receive two images. The images are visually similar, um, but only one of them is correct. Uh, so in the top example, only the right image is correct, uh, because that's the only image that has beats on it, right? And is on a white table. 
And in the second example, the yellow shirted tennis player looking for incoming ball, the left image is the correct one. On the right image, you also see a tennis player, but they're not wearing a yellow shirt. So what is the advantage of, of this task? Well, one, um, the evaluation is much more accurate because you have annotations for true positives and negatives. You can measure accuracy in terms of binary classification accuracy, so it's very interpretable. Um, and um, because the two images are selected to be semantically similar, you, um, you get more information on sort of fine-grained uh, fine visual recognition abilities of, um, of systems. So we used Bison to analyze a bunch of captioning and retrieval systems. And you see that Bison is much more uh, realistic about the performance of these systems. If you look at captioning uh, systems, if you evaluate them in terms of scores like Blue 4 or Cider, um, you may actually get the impression that they work better than humans, right? So the systems get higher, um, higher accuracies in terms of CIDR than, uh, than humans do. But if you look at what these systems can actually do, right, like there's just no way they surpass humans. Um, and if you look at Bison scores, this is indeed um, um, much, more, uh, much more clearly reflected. Um, in particular, humans get 100% accuracy on Bison by, uh, by definition. So we hope that this could, can, can help a little bit in, um, in developing more um, accurate evaluations of the quality of, uh, of captioning systems. The last bit of work that I want to show you is some work about how we're moving, trying to move from image understanding um, to uh, physical reasoning. So how we're trying to move from images to, um, uh, to sort of uh, you know, more physical things. And in particular, I want to show you this benchmark that we developed, which is called FIRE, which is a new benchmark to test the ability of an AI agent to perform physical reasoning. In FIRE, you get these very simple uh, images or these very simple worlds, um, like, like the one you see here, where you have some objects, some are static, some are dynamic. Um, and you always have a green object and a blue or purple object. And your goal is to try and make sure that the green object is going to touch the blue or purple object. And the way you can do that is by placing a red ball in the world and playing the simulator. So let's do that here. So we place a red ball, the red ball falls down and lo and behold, this is a solution to the problem because the green ball is touching the blue ball. So, so just to zoom in a little bit more, these are the stages in the fire benchmark. You start with an initial scene where you have a green object and a purple or blue object that need to, need to be touching. You place a, a red ball in the world somewhere. So you take an action, you run the simulation, and then you observe whether or not you've solved the task. So in this case, in the left two um, examples, you have not solved the task. In the right case, you did. And the solution strategies that you need uh, in order to solve these problems are very, very diverse. Um, so you may have to make catapults, um, or you, you may have to make seesaws, or you may have to block some objects, right? It's really sort of a high diversity of different strategies that your agent will have to learn in order to solve the fire test. And to make this fun for you, we actually developed 50 of these tasks. Uh, 25 of them require a single ball to be solved. You see those on the left here. And 25 of them require actually the placement of two red balls in order to be, uh, to be solved. So they require more complex strategies. Um, and so um, this, this gives you a benchmark to really test agents on their physical reasoning abilities. And we've designed the tasks in a way that they cannot be solved well by random search. So what you're seeing here is the percentage of tasks solved by taking random attempts um, for both the one ball and the two ball um, cases. And what you see is that if you were just doing random attempts, you'd have to do about 10,000 attempts in order to solve the one ball tasks and about 100,000 attempts to solve the two ball tasks, right? So you really need to do better than random search. We trained a bunch of, um, of systems on uh, on fire. And what we find is that um, sort of the common 
uh, reinforcement learning algorithms, things like deep Q networks, they don't really work very well on, um, on fire, right? Um, so the, uh, the gray bar here is the, the sort of optimal ranking that you can do of, uh, of actions. And the purple line here corresponds to what a, a deep Q network would, uh, would learn, right? And so there's really a lot of opportunity for, um, uh, for improvement here. Um, and a lot of work that needs to be done to solve a task like fire. So that was a very quick overview of some of the work that we're, that we're doing both in visual recognition and in visual understanding. Um, and I think sort of, if you, if you look at it, at our work at a little bit of a high level, then what we see is that visual recognition is really starting to work very well, but we still have a long way to go. Um, we still have a long way to go in terms of developing systems that really work for everyone, right? Um, we, we really need to take care to prevent networks from having undesired biases or, or not working well for, for certain sets of users. And the other thing we see is that we still have a long way to go towards visual understanding. If we want to uh, go beyond just image classification and detection and segmentation, it's still really, really tough. And we've been doing a lot of work in that space. I've showed you uh, uh, Bison for, for image captioning, but we've seen similar things in visual question answering where we developed a benchmark called, uh, called Clever in order to try and deal with some of the issues that we see in, in visual question answering evaluations. Um, and these systems, you know, they're starting to work, like they can do basic recognition, um, but, but beyond that, they're still really, uh, really struggling. You see the same in physical reasoning in, in tasks like fire. So this is really still uh, a work in progress. I hope this has given you a, a quick overview of, of some of the work that we're doing in our, in our team. And I thank you very much.